Well, we're so lucky to have with us the co-founder and CEO of Matic, Mehul Nariawala. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. And and uh, just to be clear, I'm co-founder and president on the product side. My partner is co-founder and CEO. So one slight clarity there. Great. Thank you for the correction. Thanks for having me, though. So uh, we've been playing around with your robot for a while here, and I have so many questions for you. So this is a vacuuming, mopping robot. And I, I kind of mm-hmm. want to ask you, when did you start first working on this? Unofficially, August 15th would be the eight years since we started thinking about it. Officially, we really got going uh, in the summer of 2018. Yeah. So we started thinking about it, but then we spent a lot of time just doing a lot of research and we started getting got going in summer of 2018. So it's been seven years since we uh, started working on it and, and thinking about this product. So if we go back to that time, there were other robots on the market. So what made you want to make your own? That's a great question. So to give you a little bit of a background, me and my co-founder, we've been working to- together for 20 years. He has a PhD thesis in computer vision. His PhD thesis is classical, a foundational piece of classical computer vision. And I've also built computer vision products. So when I looked at in 2016, I got a golden retriever. That dog shed twice a year, six months each. So that sort of prompts you to get the robot floor cleaner. So I got all the robot floor cleaners and just realized that they were automated, but they weren't necessarily intelligent, okay. but they were still pretty dumb. That meant that they would constantly chew wires, constantly get on, uh, chew Legos and get on my, uh, kids toys. But then the one that I really tried was Dyson's 360 robotic vacuum. When it first came out, if you guys may remember, and Dyson has an amazing suction. So I had this vision that they would probably solve the problem. Uh, but it got onto one of our really nice rugs. And they have amazing suctions and rug shed. And because of that amazing suction and not enough torque in the robot, it got stuck. Stayed on it for 45 minutes. Oh, and when I came spot. home in the same spot, when I came home, picked up the robot, the entire patch of the rug was gone. So a thousand dollar robot ruined a, you know, quite expensive rug. And that was the end of that robot in my home. So that sort of just piqued our curiosity that, wait a minute, uh, you know, if you kind of go back to 2016, 2017 timeframe, there were literally 200 plus self driving car startups in Silicon Valley. Uh, There were equal amount of industrial robotics companies. And I remember thinking that, wait a minute, why isn't anyone solving home robotics problem? You know, first Roombas came out in 2002. Now we are sitting here in 2017. It's as if, you know, BlackBerry never changed to iPhone. As it's, it's as if iPhone never came out. And that's how it was there back then. So it just felt like there was an opportunity to reimagine the robot and reimagine home robotics with AI first approach, computer vision first approach versus just sensor first approach. So we just asked ourselves this question. So many people are working on quote unquote level five self-driving cars. You know, robot taxis and Waymo's are becoming real and level five cars means that cars drive like humans. Then why can't we have a robots in the indoor world that behave like humans? And in this case, they clean like humans. So we started thinking along that line and they're like, then we're like, wait, what, what does it even mean to have it clean like humans? So in the context of Roomba and this robot, we're like, wait, why did this, does it sit on the dock 23 hours a day? Maybe it should go and explore our home and look for dirt and dirty spots. And if it finds it, it should just clean it. Why does it need to bump constantly? That doesn't make sense. Why can't it, you know, understand where is wires, where are rugs, where are tassels, and avoid all of those things and just understand that I can vacuum thick pile rugs and, and carpets, but I shouldn't, I can both vacuum and mop hard surfaces. Uh, but more importantly, even today, most of the robots, if you start a cycle, they get off the dock, they will clean for a few minutes. But if you pick it up in the middle of the cycle, put it back on the dock and start again, it will start this cycle again. It has no memory that I just cleaned it, but we pick up where we left off, right? It should get off and start cleaning the kitchen or whichever home area is dirtier the most, because that's what we do. We don't take vacuum out of the closet and clean beside the closet. So getting off the dock and cleaning besides the dock doesn't make sense as well. So there's just all this low hanging fruit and a lot of these things to be, to give a a robot vacuum vendors a compliment. They have made a lot of improvements since, you know, time we began working on it. Uh, they have made strides, but it just feels like they're still just adding in, in incrementally versus fundamentally to imagining what would the robot look like in the age of AI. Uh, and that was just on the functional piece of the puzzle. The other thing that personally that I really disliked, and this is my own personal opinion, but one was hair, uh, Astro's hair would constantly get clogged uh, and then the bin would get full. And instead of uh, letting me that know that bin is full, it would just spit out ball of hair everywhere onto the floor. That was not good. Then we got this other uh, robot, which had a self-cleaning dogs. 
And those self-cleaning dogs, I don't know if you've ever tried one, but they literally at some point sound like a, a rocket launcher taking off because it's vacuum cleaning the vacuum in an anti-gravity fashion. And every time that went off, it completely scared my dog and he would freak out, start barking. My three-year-old would start crying. So that was a really good experience as well. But even more than that, uh, if you are a husband and you bring things into your wife home, you need your wife's approval. And all these dogs, as I brought them in and was trying out, she would just tell me that get this spaceship out of the way. I don't want it to be visible in my family room or living room. So that made us realize that, hey, robots needs to be friendly. If they are inside our home, if they belong in our home, they should not scare my pets and kids. They need to be friendly and maybe even enhance the uh, decor of the home. Maybe even feel like it belongs. It needs to blend in as a family member. Uh, the other one was they can't be noisy because no one likes noisy guests. So can we actually make it quiet? So all these things sort of just started popping in our head. And we thought there was a huge opportunity to come and solve this problem from computer vision first perspective and give robot really a brains and eyes. And that was our background. So that's how we started and specifically computer vision, because we felt like indoor world is built by humans for humans to take advantage of our humans perception system, which is predominantly vision based. So that's how we started thinking about it and then got started. And so I think that you have a lot of background, it sounds like, in testing out multiple robot vacuums for viewers at home who their vacuum has a handle on it. Kind of walk us through how the typical, you know, puck shaped robot vacuum handles cleaning and, and seeing things and, and dealing with things. What is that sort of sensor based system look like? At a very high level as a family owner, I mean, as a homeowner and a father with kids and pets, both me and my wife, we just felt like we were cleaning all the time. And we all have a desire to live in a perpetually clean home with perpetually clean floors and we don't want to do it. For which robots are amazing because if they can clean on our behalf, then they can really save our time and energy. So I think I have to give credit to iRobot for recognizing that very early on in 2002. And they built this robot, uh, Roomba, and brought it to the market in 2002. But the first Roombas, because for 2002, they were phenomenal. But first Roombas were literally like uh, putting a blindfold around our eyes. And then we, we hold our hand and we just kind of you know, mouse off each wall and hopefully we covered the entire area. So there was nothing except that bump sensor. And the idea was that if you bounce enough times, you can paint the entire room just like a Pong video game. So that was really great. But back then there was no computer vision. Computers were still very rudimentary early days. So it was a great idea and they got this going. So I have to give credit to them. Then a company called Nito came out, uh, which was also based in the United States. And they started adding what is referred to as a single pixel LiDAR. So a lot of disc robots have this little circle on top of it, almost like a hat. And what that is, is still you as a human being, you have a, a blindfold around your head, but now you have this one hand extended out as a laser. It's a single pixel laser. And as you're moving around, if you touch a wall, you're like, okay, there is an obstacle. I'm not going to do it. So in the same way, laser touches the wall. It knows there is an obstacle. But if the obstacle is slightly higher or lower than the laser's height, it's going to completely miss it. So it's still going to bump into that. So if you have wires or, you know, toys on the floor or any sort of a soft material, it will miss all of that stuff. And that's pretty much where it has been. Then they ha there is a, they've been adding optic, uh, uh, optical sensors and some obstacle detection sensors. But really, fundamentally, you, this robots just cannot see. Now, even, you know, our dog, dogs and pets can, and pets and I mean, dogs and cats can navigate our home very precisely without bumping into things. The reason is because they also have a vision as a system. So that's where we felt like vision was the way to go, that if you're going to build a fully autonomous robot, uh, we have to come back and start with computer vision in the first place. Why did you go with the form factor that you have? Like every other competitor seems to have gone with a puck and then yes. we got yours and we were playing around with it. And it's like, hmm, this is a completely different shape. Everyone we showed it to was like, that's not a vacuum. It's not, it doesn't look like, you know, it's supposed to be a puck shape. So why did you guys go with yeah. this shape? Great question. So we at some point did a thought experiment. So, so first... Historically, puck shape is a great shape because if you're just bouncing things around and you don't know where it is, it can pivot onto the same axis and go underneath the a very uh, a very uh, low furniture and not get stuck. So that's where the design was great. But we did this two thought experiment. We we're like, look, if puck shape is such a great uh, it's floor cleaning, why aren't all the manual vacuums puck shape too? Why are the rectangular cleaning here? 
what turns out rectangular gets the sides and corners very, very well. And you actually want that ability and that cleaning it. So that was one. The second thing we also did is that let's assume we have invented time machine and we can take this puck shed robot and send it to fifties and sixties and ask people, Hey, what is it? What is this? There's a good chance that they wouldn't be able to guess that it's a robot or a vacuum. So first thing we realized is that we wanted a, a robot to look like a robot. So design for the robot wasn't based on a, hey, whether it's a vacuum or not, it's based on that, hey, it looks like a robot. And when you have that structure, that's when it feels friendly to uh, to pets and users. So that's where we designed the high vantage point of the height. Then we added a cleaning head because we wanted to be very clear to from customer point of view that this is a clean robot. It's not Alexa on wheels. Uh, the cleaning head is also rectangular so that it can go into sides and corners very, very well and clean every along those lines. The other reason uh, is uh, for making it much higher is we realized that puck shape robots were also built for world in late 90s. It was still wall to wall carpet. Almost all of us still had a majority of a carpet. Now it's almost all hard surfaces, thick pile rugs, wires, thresholds, and that small flat robot are unable to climb over that. So we give it a much bigger wheel so it can go over these thick pile rugs and clean them. And then the other reason for doing it along the same way is that we wanted robot to see the same way we do as a human being in a top-down manner. Versus if you have a flat robot, then you're seeing like an ant-like vantage point from the sides. And from that perspective, it's very hard to understand the world. So we wanted it to see the same way as well so it can see obstacles and all kinds of things in a very human-centric way. And then it can avoid it. So all those things come up and then we added like a round, very unsharp corner. So they're all rounded corners and uh, simple white and black design so that it blends into the home, that it feels friendly to kids. And it's a shape that is a little bit more expected. And because of that, uh, one of the things that I'm super proud of is that pets and kids absolutely love the robot. And this is very counter to any disc robots that we've seen or I personally tested. So you guys got really started on it in 2018, right? And when did you think you'd be hitting the market? <laughs> Great question. We thought we would be, uh, we were optimistic. Uh, you know, there is a, there is this quote that uh, if you knew how hard it was going to be, probably you would have never been started. So we thought we were going to ship in uh, 2020. A uh, joke inside the companies, we're only off by one digit because we are in 2025 here and shipping. Uh, but but it took a long time, yeah. And the reason it took a long time is is we just realized that Adding intelligence required a lot of fundamental foundational building uh, of the vision system that wasn't there. Uh, and, and just like self-driving cars took a long time in a similar way, homes have a different challenges in self-driving cars. If you make a mistake, mistakes could be fatal and you don't want to make them in home environment. Our homes, and, and I tend to think of a final frontier of AI as home because homes are the most cluttered, dynamic, unstructured, and chaotic spaces you'll ever go. There is literally zero structure. And now that I've been to about 200 homes testing our robot and talking to customers, yeah, homes are unique. And people have a lot of amazing taste and different appreciation. And that, that really makes it very, very hard to build a robot for that. And it took us a long time to get here, but we're excited to be here. I'm really curious about that those years because I, as a Tesla owner and having watched Tesla every single day, I yeah. realized that, you know, what we experienced in say 2016 with autopilot is not what we experienced today with FSD, right? And in the early days, it felt like a 14 year old was driving your car and now it feels like a 22 year old is driving your car. Like it's a complete difference. So when you got started, I imagined that like a lot of normal things in a house, like a table or a couch or something, were problems you had to figure out, like how does it approach these things, right? It was even more fundamental. So if you're trying to build self-driving car, right, you have Google Maps, which tell, tells car where the road is going. You have GPS, which tells car where the road is located, right? If we didn't have this information, if we are behind the wheels, we are also lost. So no matter how smart the robot is, it needs to know where it's going to go and where it's located. But then in an indoor world, the first challenge was how does robot know whether it's on the right side of the counter or the left side of the counter, right side of the uh, couch or the left side of the couch. That precise understanding of localization is actually really missing. Okay. So one other, like this is very technical, we're going into weeds here, but if you get any other robot vacuum or any other indoor robot, maybe Amazon Astro or even industrial robot besides Matic, what you'll observe is that they will make you start initial mapping run from the uh, from the dock itself. That's because what they do is they build a relative map. They only know their position from that starting point. 
Now, what happens is wheels drift a lot. So if you're using wheel encoding and all kinds of stuff, eventually that air drift adds up and you actually create a, a lot of error prone mistakes uh, and you run into this. The second challenge that relative map to me is akin to saying that I can navigate my home if I enter through front door, but if I enter through side door or back door, I'm lost mm. because I don't have a frame of reference anymore of the front door. Instead, what we do for Matic, for example, is build completely uh, at, uh, what we refer to as absolute map. It's a, it, it, where doc is just another point into the system. So that allows you to, and that algorithm is called simultaneous location and mapping slam algorithm. And what we learned, and the reason it took us a long time is that we learned along the way that while SLAM was theoretically and a research point of view solved in mid eighties, there just wasn't a good implementation of it. Our thought was that, hey, maybe we'll be able to use some open source library and solve this problem. Turns out uh, the best analogy, it wasn't there. So we spent about four years solving this problem in a very methodical way. And the best analogy I can give you is if you use touch interfaces pre-iPhone, and what iPhone did is just made it silky smooth. And now it's actually delightful to use. So in the same way, there have been implementation of SLAM for the first 20 years. And some of these robots, puck-shaped robots also implement them. But they were just really rudimentary. They were relative. They weren't uh, precise. And what we did is build a system where robot absolutely doesn't get lost. That was our thing that can you give a robot an ability that we have? which is when if you go into a new home or new uh, place as we are trying to buy it or an open house, let's say, we would explore. As we're exploring, we're, all, uh, we're not taking the most precise path, but we're actually already mapping the whole home. And just within two rounds, we can actually figure out where things are and start taking precise uh, uh, precise path from point A to point B. Cool. So, so the cool part about it, knowing that it's going to keep getting smarter versus most other robots where that's it, you know? Mm. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really how, how we thought about it, that we'll learn, we'll iterate, and we'll keep moving forward. Cool. Well, thanks again for hanging out with us. Thanks for having me. See you, dude. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks.